My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. This is your host. Today, I have Ganesh, Ganesh Dava, uh, and he is a Tamil Canadian director, writer, actor, and fun fact, a gardening enthusiast. And with a marketing degree, he jumped ship from the competitive world of advertising, mayonnaise, and cat food into uh, the obviously less challenging world of entertainment. So he's the youngest of eight. He started writing because it was never his turn to do anything else. And by the way, I'm reading this straight from the site. He has an excellent copy, which is why, you know, someone writes something good, why change it? Having stumbled upon writing, he uses a medium to explore his voice by taking everyday moments like family feuds or love affairs and investigating them from underrepresented perspectives. Uh, his fascination on how humanity survives change and adversity is inspired by watching his immigrant father start a business from nothing. Um, so, you know, uh, without further ado, you know, there's a lot more great stuff out there, but I'll let uh, Ganesh, uh, you know, tell his own story. So Ganesh, welcome to the show. Hi, 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 Era. Nice to, nice to finally meet you and thank you for having me. Excited to talk shop. <laughs> yeah, I'm always excited to talk to actors just because, like I said, my best, I think I was telling you my best friend, Boss Renga, who was like episode, I don't know, 40 something, a few episodes ago. He's an actor. So I've kind of always heard his journey. Like I, I like I've known him for like 20 plus years. So he used to be, he used to be engineering with me, but then he dropped out after like a couple of years to secretly kind of learn acting and, you know, do that whole thing and just kind of hearing about all the constant rejections and like, you know, the small wins and, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm, I mean, I definitely don't have creativity like that in my bones, but I respect it because I've, you know, seen how hard he's worked, also his brother as well. So that's why I was really excited to kind of talk to you. So um, for me, <laughs> I, for me, I like to start at the beginning. I feel like, um, you know, I, I feel like I repeat this every time, at the, but I feel like childhood and the things you're exposed to and the decisions you make or like are, or are made for you could ultimately kind of, you know, um, set you on this path and, you know, get you where you are today. So reflecting back, tell us a bit about your upbringing and kind of how that got to, you know, spark your love of, you know, film slash acting slash writing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool that you said I've never really looked back and analyzed how my upbringing affected me. but. Um, you know, when I think about it, though, I, I grew up with, um, I grew up, I was born in Jaffna and lived there till I was, uh, not lived there, but like lived around um, the northern part till I was around seven. And I was moving around and my parents actually left me to come to Canada and my dad was in a different city. So I was raised by an aunt and uh, an uncle and my cousins. And it was, it was so interesting now that I think about it because they grew up and they raised me around so much adversity just so much going on. And yet at home, I always felt so much joy and comfort and support and love. And that made me, I guess that really affected who I became as a person and how I saw the world. So when I moved to Canada and, you know, I was, I was the youngest of eight kids and that has its own, own implications of how I am affected as a human being. Um, and, you know, being the youngest, it's, uh, it's never your turn to do anything. You never get it to have your voice be heard as much. And so that yearning kind of all, always like peaked in me that I want to just say something. Can someone just listen to me? Um, and then that paired with my experiences of, you know, being bullied and um, experiencing how to navigate this new world really painted um, how I saw the world and how I could see that everybody has their own own, own struggles, bigger or small, but for them, it's so important and visceral. And every day they're doing these small little things to push through it. And that's so exciting. So um, that's, that's how I see the world. And I'm sure that perspective of looking at people's perseverance comes from watching my family persevere through so much um, through my childhood and to this day. Well, like another secret reason for me asking these questions, like I always love asking this question of different guests is, I'm like a recent dad, well, not recent, like 16 months or a little about that, but me and my wife had twins. And I'm always fascinated by like, you know, I always reflect back now that I'm a parent, like, like, how did I get here? What kind of things did I do? What can I, what kind of things can I do to create a certain path or environment for like my kids to flourish? So it's really interesting kind of your answer. 
uh, around that. So like, you know, you're the youngest of eight, you know, you came here, you talked about bullying, a lot of, you know, challenges. Um, tell us how that impacted kind of, you know, um, I guess how you got into acting and then obviously like the writing part of it as well. Yeah, I think I was always a shy kid. I was always a shy kid growing up through elementary school um, because again, being the youngest of eight, you, you just, you kind of turn into your shell. I mean, I, at least I did. I kind of just, my brothers were, so my two older sisters who were, you know, very by the books, like good girls doing what parents wanted them to do. And then I had five brothers after them who were just all over the place. And just like growing up in Scarborough, they, just like the whole spectrum of different things boys do. And so I was like, I need to be different. I need to make my parents see me. So I became the good kid. The, the kid who, you know, listened to all the rules, that was doing good in school, had no troubles, had no issues with anybody. And that made me sort of become closed into my own shell. So I was good on paper, but in, in real life, I was kind of just going through the motions of life. So when I hit high school, I had a conversation with myself about, I need to do something different. I felt like I wasn't living. I felt like I was living for other people and for my parents. And I wanted to figure out what it meant for me to live. So in grade nine, I tried out different clubs and different things at school. And there was an audition for the school production of Romeo and Juliet. And I've never sang, danced, or acted before. Um, I think I did like a Nadaham in like uh, Sri Lanka back home when I was in grade two or something where I played the Nadada. But um, as, as like someone who really knew what was going on, I didn't really act much. So in grade nine, I auditioned and, and somehow... I wasn't good. I think it was a pity acceptance, but the acting teacher was like, hey, you can do the prologue, which is just this huge monologue at the top of Romeo and Juliet. And I did it, but like when I went on stage and I know I wasn't the lead and there was all these other cast members, um, but the spotlight was on me and there were 200 people in the audience here to listen to whatever the hell I, I had to say. And I've never felt that kind of um, care and listening um, and voice before. And so that's where my need to explore acting came in where I was uh, I felt like this was a place where I could feel safe and share my thoughts um but then but then when you get into sort of the acting world you realize it, there's a lot of it is it, it's it's tough I mean your, your friend probably told you how tough it is and how it's so um controlled in how you get and how many opportunities you get and that's why I then moved into writing um where I got to actually do whatever the hell I wanted to do instead of what other people wanted me to do. Yeah, I think that's what he told me about writing is that obviously the climate is slowly changing to kind of enable more diversity in acting, still not there yet. But he said writing was a way to kind of write the stories that he wished he had opportunities to play. Um, so I, it's almost like entrepreneurial in a way, you know, like when you can't, yeah. you know, when a certain company would hire you, they're like, screw it, I'll just start my own company like that and create my own opportunities. So that's interesting. As you were talking, I, I was just curious because I came to Canada when I was like two. So I have like no recollection of anything back back in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. um, you came here when you're a bit older. What is your, like, what can you remember from Sri Lanka? Like, is it good, bad, or like, you know, tell me about that. I'm just very curious if you have any memories that you can remember. So the only memories I have are good ones. Um, so I remember... The, the brief moment of my life that I do remember, I think I was six or seven, where my aunts and uncle, they've left Jaffna and then they lived in um, Kilnachi for a bit. And then the brief part that I remember is when we lived in Vaunia for, I don't know how long, but for a while. And we had a rented house and the house had this huge, I mean, to me as a little kid, it looked huge garden that surrounded the whole perimeter of the, the house and we had mango trees jackfruits pomegranates and I and I just scavenged and roamed every day after school I'd come and I'd roam um, I'd get because um, you know you'd cook on open flames so I, I, I'd put like bricks together and make my own little flames and throw random things and cook and I just felt so free and unabashedly myself uh, and I know I just talked about how in elementary school I was shy and you know closed off but as a kid in Sri Lanka, I was so free. There was so much freedom. You had land to play with. Nobody was really policing you. I remember even in acting, sometimes your acting coach would be like, oh, think about a moment when you were truly free. And I would go back to that moment of just wandering with no, um, no fences and you just do whatever. 
so that's kind of what I remember. And even in school, I had a couple of friends and we just run around. I remember huge open, you know, dirt fields and you just run around, make up games and play. That's what I remember. Um, but when I came to Canada around grade three time, I started having a lot of um, mental health stuff. And I think it was mild. It wasn't diagnosed or anything, but I think it was some sort of PTSD because I think I lived through a lot of stuff happening around me and I might have just closed them off, but I had to go through therapy to close off whatever it was that I saw um, or experienced or heard. So, yeah, I mean, the, the mind remembers what it wants to remember. Interesting. OK, you know, for me, how I heard about you is I don't I think I don't know how Instagram works. I know a lot of people are not fans of social media, but I love social media for you know, I, I think it's like a tool you can take the best or like make the yeah. most out of it. And I think I stumbled across a post of yours, I think, where um, you were in the movie. I think you just announced that you were going to be in Spin. Back then it was oh, like yeah. a, the upcoming like announcement or the, the Disney Channel film. So, you know, I know in acting, there's a lot of rejection, a lot of negative, you know, before you kind of get those a bit more regularity in your successes. But even then, it's not guaranteed. How did you react when you got that? part in in spin it was really exciting i i'm not gonna lie i was very happy about it because for the longest time i've been booking a, a good chunk of commercials which honestly i sh I, I was very grateful for because i know even that a lot of people don't don't get um but um I, it's just and i treat every acting opportunity as a learning um thing because I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I feel a lot of imposter syndrome always in the industry. So every time I book a role, I'm like, oh, it's, I'm just I'm like waiting to fail. So I just take everything as a learning opportunity. So I don't put much pressure on it. But this one, when it came, I, I couldn't treat it like that. I was like, this is such a big deal. It was the first South Asian uh, led, you know, Disney Channel film. Uh, it was my first feature film. It was my first union project, um, which meant that I'd be then leading my way to becoming full union. Uh, so for multi multitude of reasons, I was so happy about it and proud of myself. Um, I remember I was at maybe Main Street Unionville walking with my friends, having dinner or something. And I got the email from my agent, hey man, you booked it. And I, I screamed with joy and hugged my friends. And it was just a, a great memory that I'll, that I'll have. Yeah. Amazing. I know we just talked about like something positive, but, you know, just for the, the people that are listening, it's, you know, you got to play the long game and you got to be pretty persistent. Yeah, just, I guess, keep pushing. So like when you don't get a part, like, you know, say the opposite happened, like there's another part that you were so close to getting, because I know with my friend, there's so many times when he was told he was a second or third person and it could have been like this huge life-changing role. How do you deal with like that kind of situation when you're so close? Mm -hmm. And then how do you <laughs> motivate yourself to kind of keep going as well? Oh, oh, that's such a, such a, I mean, it's such a great question um, that I've been in that position so many times earlier last year, I was, there was like a couple, but one specific Netflix project um, that I was like so close in, um, but it just didn't work out, uh, which is very unfortunate. And, I, and I'll be honest, it's, it's sad. It's demotivating sometimes, um, but it happens so often in the industry and I don't, and, it happened. Yeah, it happens so often, but I also don't, I don't just act. I, I write and direct and do other stuff. And in each of those different buckets, they all have tons of rejection. So I have, I, I live with rejection all around me um, to the point where I, I have started to sort of normalize it and how I process it at least is, and this is something I um, developed with my therapist. I'm very pro therapy. I, I think everyone needs to go, <laughs> not everyone needs to go to therapy, but I think it's helpful. Um, and so I, and I like to process my thoughts a lot and how I have sort of figured this out is, you know, when you get something, when you win something, when you uh, are successful in something, you celebrate, you go out and have uh, a drink, you go get a meal, you do something with your friends, you celebrate. Um, and you give it that ritual to process that moment and you move on. Similarly, what I've started doing is I've started to have rituals for rejections. So I, if I get rejected in something, I have a ritual where I go for a walk. I don't listen to any music and I talk to myself. I talk through all the negative and positive thoughts that come through my mind that say, you know, this is why you didn't get it. This is why you, you know, you could have done better here, blah, 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 blah. 
and I go through every single thought, give it, a, give it the attention it deserves for a, a second. And then I sort of let it go. And then I come home and I, you know, eat something I like, um, or some fried food or something. Um, so that's how I process rejection. It's been working well for me these days. And the, and the other thing I would say to anyone listening is it's, it's a matter of where you put the, the self value. So a lot of actors that I, I know and artists in general put the, the value or the thing where they put their self value is on the end result. So they would say, I'm a good actor. Or I did a good job because I booked the role. Whereas I started to reframe it as I did a good job or I'm a good actor by doing the audition. Cause that's the thing under your control. And that's the thing you can kill. And you know, you've done everything you can. You've rehearsed, you practiced to kill the audition. And then everything that happens afterward is truthfully out of your control. There's so many factors that go into casting that you can't put that on yourself and say, oh, I am not a great actor. And that's why I didn't book that. So having that clarity of how that part of the industry works really helped me define how I go through these moments of rejection uh, in a healthy way. This episode is sponsored by nobody. That's right, nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. I love your answer. I think um, number one is your comment about therapy, which I definitely, I, I think I started to see more of this, which is people go to the gym, you know, even if they're already in shape, just to kind of maintain their fitness. Therapy is a way to kind of keep up your mental fitness, your mental strength. Um, you know, even if you feel like you're in, you're healthy, um, you know, it's, it's good to kind of have that checkup if you want to call it that. And then the, uh, the other part is, um, I think, you know, you're talking about controlling what you control. I forgot who said this quote, but it's like, you know, 95% of people's like, you know, troubles or like things that they worry about. If people just worried about the things they can control and let go of the things they can, <laughs> it would make life so much easier. And like, that's definitely, I, I think no matter how good you are at that, you you definitely like I, I feel like I'm good at it, but I still definitely fall prey to, you know, worrying about the things I shouldn't worry about. But it's human nature; nobody's perfect. Um, and, so, yeah. and 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 like what you're saying about social media, it's like it, it you know it's such a wonderful tool. I studied marketing and advertising in university um, before I went into all the acting stuff. So I love social media for the power it has, but it also it has so much negative aspects of it, and that's why I think that's why I had to develop these tools for myself because there was just way too much negativity that was put on us and so much self-judgment and self-evaluation and comparison. Uh, and the worst thing about this industry is, you know, if you, if you wait for a job interview in accounting, you know, accountant number three in a firm, you don't really know who got the job, but in acting and stuff, you will be sitting in a theater and the guy who beat you is right in front of you. And you're like, right. And these are the reasons why he's better than me or they're better than me. Um, so having these habits are so necessary to be sustained in this career, for sure. I never thought about that. That's a good point. <laughs> you publicly have to like, and you publicly will like see in theater and probably in advertising <laughs> and whatever it is. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I'd love to kind of talk about, you know, the orchard and the tree, which I think I stumbled across because I'm a, a fan of the Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival. And I think it was screened in 2021. Uh, yes, last year. Yeah. 21, yeah. So tell us about that and like what inspired you to write this project and like what you're hoping the, you know, somebody watching this will get out of the film. Like I mentioned earlier, I, or, or sorry, or like you read in my bio, uh, I, I do like to explore stories of adversity and human perseverance um, in relation to all those experiences I talked about with how I saw my family move through life and how I've had to move through life. I just find those moments of pushing ourselves so beautiful and the, the truest forms of humanity where you, you know you can't go any further and yet you do. And that's, that's what's so beautiful to me. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, uh, this massive, issue is happening in my life. Oh, I, um, you know, I, I'm going through this huge divorce and I need to figure out how to maneuver through it. It doesn't need to be these big things. People go through significant um, emotional stress and um, decision-making and uh, poignant cho uh, choices that they make in even the smallest um, uh, obstacles. And I find that beautiful. So this this film is um, a way of me exploring that. It's my first uh, directorial um, product or um, art piece. 
And so in that, I talk about how a Tamil daughter and Tamil father deal with their mom's passing, but almost, uh, almost two decades later. So it's one of those things where the mother has passed and the father and the daughter live together. Now the daughter's in her twenties, the father's in his fifties, sixties. And, you know, they just never really grieved properly, which I think is something that happened in certain like South Asian and Tamil homes where they don't, they just don't talk about it. Um, Cause they don't really know how to. And like I said, there, I love therapy because a lot of people don't do therapy in sort of the older generations. Um, so there's a lot of things that could be improved on in their lives by talking, but they don't. So it kind of just lingers there. And so this story is about that lingering. And um, through the things that happen in this film, you, you see how these two slowly come together by starting to talk. And this sort of the message is really say what you need to say to the people in your life when you can, because they, they might not be there later on. Um, and so you see that dynamic of communication. And the other thing I explore is, uh, in a lot of South Asian films, you, you, you see the dynamic of like the overbearing parent and the subservient child who has to bear with them. Um, and although that can be true in a lot of households, I don't think that's the only model of South Asian parent-child dynamics. So this one explores it where the father and the daughter almost have equal power because they both sort of pulled away from their family structures into, um, into I'll do this and you do that. And they kind of live in isolation within the same home. And so you get to see them work towards helping and showing their love to each other, but with equal power. And it's really fun to watch, I think. Um, so yeah, it explores these dynamics, um, uh, these different South Asian dynamics, yeah. And how is it received by like the audience or like, you know, people just watching it? So far, so good. Um, I mean, I haven't heard anything bad, but I guess no one will say it to my face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure bad stuff is out there. Um, but so far, it's streamed. Uh, luckily, it's premiered at the Real Asian Film Festival, and then it was picked up by the Mosaic International Film Festival uh, in Miss Saga. And then it just had its New York premiere at the South Asian International Film Festival in New York. Um, and so it's kind of making its way through different audiences. Um, and I've had wonderful messages from um, Tamil folks who've just said, um, the film is not in Tamil, uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's in English um, as of right now, um, but who've watched it and just said, this, this speaks to my relationship with my parents. Because I, I guess growing up as well, one of the reasons why I like to write these stories is I, I loved the um, sort of the release from reality that film and television gave you, but often I felt so left out. I felt so left out and it was so disheartening because I felt left out at school. I felt left out at home. And in this world where we're supposed to belong and live vicariously, I also felt left out. Um, and these family models that I experienced in my house did not show up there. And that really bothered me because it made you feel like you're abnormal, even though all of our unique little um, discrepancies is what makes us kind of normal because we all have it. Uh, so I think um, the people who watched it, they, they acknowledge that. They acknowledge that these small little discrepancies, oh yeah, the power dynamics are a little different. Oh, oh yeah, like um, the daughter, you know, um, cooks for the father instead of the father cooking for the daughter, even though the daughter is smaller. Like these smaller discrepancies um, or uh, little, uh, well, discrepancy is the wrong word, uniquenesses um, made people feel seen and I, I just loved hearing that because that and I put those details in there it wasn't necessarily plot necessary for the plot but I put them in there because I was like no we she, she, she needs to dress like this the house needs to look like this it can't be pristine and proper there needs to be a scratch on the the, the bowl here and the cup needs to look like this and these little details um, I think add up to uh, this atmospheric feeling that a lot of people connected to. And how did your film kind of make its way to like various film festivals? Is it something that you apply for? Or does somebody discover it? How does that work? Yeah, uh, usually, uh, unless you're some big name director or something, um, it, it is through uh, application process and then they vet through all the films they get and they pick the few that they want to screen at their festival. So it is a, it is a competitive process. Um, with with um, MISAF, uh, they, um, it was kind of a, interesting relationship because I was also featured as their MISAF star for that year. 
um, as an emerging actor and director uh, nominated by ACTRA, um, which is the Actors Union. So they they kind of already had me on their radar because of that aspect of the relationship. So they then it only made sense and was fitting that they featured my film as well. Um, but with other FISTA festivals, you have to submit. Um, and luckily, this is, this is where I go back to my business training and why I'm so grateful for it. I am able to write these applications and present the market viability, but also the narrative viability of my film in, uh, in a way that's uh, digestible for these people making these decisions. Yeah, I want to kind of hone in on that because um, I think on your site, you described, okay, I, having project managed teams of up to 50 and budgets in the millions, you know, you understand entrepreneurial problem solving and interpersonal skills required to be at a minimum, a decent director. And when I heard that description, I don't often hear a director being described. Like when I hear of a James Cameron or somebody like that, that's not the first thing that pops to mind. And it's very like business centric. So uh, I guess everyone, like, I guess, how did you, why did you describe it like that? And then number two, um, you know, being a dir director is quite different from being an actor. Uh, how are you able to, you know, shift back and forth, you know, between being an actor and director. I know maybe sometimes it's not required in the project, but I feel like, you know, if you're used to always being the actor or used to being the director, when you're in the other shoe, sometimes it feels a bit strange to kind of make that shift. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of the first one about how, how I, why I describe directing like that, uh, I think every direct every director has their own style and stuff, and I've been fortunate enough to shadow some people and see some people's processes. Um, there, there, there are people who come into directing with um, a ton of sort of classical and contemporary training in the in that art form of making movies and color palettes and color theory and all these wonderful things and lens stories. Um, I, I, I did not have that luxury to get that kind of training. And so um, um, the, the, that that stuff, the sort of the creative storytelling uh, tools, is a is a skills that I'm still learning and picking up as an emerging director, and I learn through master classes and stuff. Um, but inherently, I know I have a very specific vision, which I think is what a director needs is a vision, um, and that's why I connect that idea of having a vision to these management skills, because in a management not management, that sounds like such a weird word to me now because I've moved away from that world. Um, but in that sort of uh, cooperative, collective world of working together, having a singular vision that joins a team together is what makes that system work. And so being able to have a vision, but also be open to your collaborators' ideas and their inputs, their feedback, their contemplations about why your idea, your vision might not be the right idea and being able to have a strong productive discussion about that. These are all the skills that I think make a good director so that, cause you hire people on a team and you come in as a director but you hire a DOP who is a master of their craft. They know exactly what lens to use. They know exactly what to do with the lights. You hire um, script coordinators who will look at the set and talk to you about continuity and why this will be, you need to figure out how to shoot this because the continuity might be off. You hire art directors who will come in and make the set the way they think it's going to be practical for your project. So you bring in all these experts. So you can be the type of director who would be like, hey, you know what you're doing, but I'm going to tell you what to do. Or you can be like, hey, you know what you're doing. I don't know what how cameras work entirely. Come here and listen to my vision. Tell me how you're going to bring that to life. And that's how I work. And I know in that, in that description you read, it sounds so robust, but it actually is a, a, a wonderful way to describe how, it, it's a robust description of a very fluid process. If that, that makes, makes sense. any sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. You know, you talked about earlier, you know, a lot about family and, you know, being the youngest of eight and, you know, uh, feeling left out, but like, as you've kind of grown up and, you know, you're, you know, you've immersed yourself from like a traditional thing, which is business, which, you know, Tamil parents and family like understand to like acting, which I think more people are kind of understanding that, but still, you know, still kind of in that small minority of people. Um, how do like, how does your, you know, family, friends and just general support system feel about your choice to kind of immerse yourself in the acting world? And, you know, have they, you know, agreed with it? Have they voiced their displeasure? Are they like mm -hmm. coming out and seeing all your stuff? Like, tell, tell me about that. 
Did you know that every time you left a 5 out of 5 review for this podcast, a Tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts? Okay, that's probably not true, but if there's a chance that it is, do you really want to jinx it? Leave a review. Do it for the young creative in you. I I've started to see the world as a spectrum and not as a binary thing. I used to be so fixated, you know, having been that good smart boy in school on the binary of this is right this is wrong this is good this is bad um and really focusing on that and and I grew up and my family also raised me and they were also like that so it was either you know these three job titles that we described you know the doctor and the obvious ones um or not and that and if it's not then you're a bad person I guess or you're going to fail at life somehow even though millions of other people are doing other careers so it was always so black and white and at some point around university where i was doing this the, the right thing of business school i was like if this is the right thing it should feel right and it doesn't and that's when i started questioning is it all black and white is it is it one or the other and i started noticing that things are a spectrum that it can be a multitude of things at any given point in time and it can fluctuate and that's kind of how i started approaching this career with my family is that i'm not giving up being a business person i'm not giving up a a house and a, a sustainable life in the future but in this t- moment in time this is what i want to be doing um and so yes there was pushback at first like even when the, the first time when i told them was in grade 12 hey i want to audition for theater schools and it was a very black and white like theater school or business school and it was like this or that and then we had to choose one and we chose business school because of what they wanted but then as i got older and things things stop being so binary i could say hey i'm i'm going to be i'm going to be working this job at this arts council um but i'm meeting a whole bunch of cool artists here i'm a little inspired by them to try this thing so can i i'm going to take some acting classes but i never told them uh when you described your friend i loved that you said secretly because that's <laughs> what i did cuz i never told them it wasn't uh, again i didn't need it to be binary so i was like working my thing when in the night i'll leave for like 3 hours i'll go take an acting class downtown and i did that for a couple of months and then i got an agent and nobody knew and then i started booking some gigs nobody really knew and then i started making money not a lot of money but enough money that they were like oh i guess you're good at this thing um and that i guess you have a degree and you're making money so i guess we'll support you and it kind of started um in that way of like reeling them in and then i started showing them um audition tapes i do um where i thought i did some compelling work and they'd be like oh whoa like what cuz they thought i'm going to do acting like you know like like tamil actors like in the in the hollywood films like vijay and stuff and like do all this stuff which I, i've tried and i don't think i can do yet um but i was doing more uh western contemporary work and they were moved by it um and then so it was like a slow process of being like hey i'm still this but i'm this and i'm this and then that and then i started um getting more and more uh acting work and then that slowly transitioned into me me saying hey like this is becoming a thing that's working so i'm going to stop my full time job which was a discussion but it worked and they understood cuz it was a slow ease in and then i was like hey i'm also going to do some writing and then i'm going to and then i tell them yeah hang on i'll take 2 months right now to direct this film so it was it was a it was a fluid thing but i never really said hey i'm an actor it was never that binary and then um and then i slowly started identifying as multiple things cuz we can be anything we want whenever we want to be you don't need to bucket yourself yeah you know in terms of like um you were just making a comment about how you know you kind of it almost sounded like you wanted their buy in in your decision to kind of pursue acting more than you know these other things you're doing um out of curiosity um why didn't you just you know if you're if that trend of like where money was coming from was trending upwards on acting um and it's obviously the thing you enjoy doing why didn't you just be like this is what i'm doing like almost like this is what i'm doing and uh mm. you know that's that's it i'm just curious there's no right or wrong answer but i'm just curious yeah no why. i and I, i guess everyone uh, yeah everyone everyone would approach that situation differently um early on in my when i was in undergrad and not having even not doing anything remotely close to acting or artistic um a friend of mine who who's middle middle eastern got cast in like a big film um and i told i told my mom i was like hey like look this guy from my high school got 
Wait a this minute. thing. When you say a friend of yours, are you talking about the guy from Aladdin? Yes. Ah, as soon as you said it, I was like, there's no, like, there's only one person I can think of that's Canadian that recently, in recent memory, got a huge fart. Okay. <laughs> so funny. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, we went to high school together and then, um, and then um, I'm a part of his mentorship program with his specific thing. So I, 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 I know him. Um, um, and so, yeah, so he got the part and I remember telling my mom and being like, hey, like, this guy is making it fudge like maybe I should have started because he, he he had a really interesting story um uh, me and I'm a sued he That's he amazing. was in yeah he was in drama he was in high school with us killing it in drama like in Romeo and Juliet he was Mercutio he was killing it always and then his he his parents um you know made him go to UFT I believe for aerospace or something and then after the first semester or something he knew that wasn't his calling dropped out and went to theater school and then committed and did the whole thing worked in toronto acting world and then moved his way up obviously um and i was telling my mom I'm like hey look if i went to theater school this could have been me and then <laughs> I'm, and my my mom was like uh she, she asked like how does he look and i'm like what do you mean he's like well it's like is he, is he like light-skinned or dark-skinned like what does he look like and i was like oh i guess he's light-skinned it's like well there you go i'm like and I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, even in our, even in our own film industry, they don't really cast dark-skinned people. So there's a lot of different factors that affected their fear for me. Um, I, I wasn't like, like a conventionally, like the, I didn't have the conventional body shape. Uh, I didn't, I, you know, my skin color was different. Just like, there's so many different reasons why. And they struggled so much that they don't, they, they even if, even if this, financial success in that short time made sense they knew in the long term like how is this going to work they couldn't fathom it um so because of all those reasons um i i i knew it would be hard for them to understand if i was like hey this is the thing and i sat down and explained the whole thing to them so i had to temper them at least knowing my parents i had to temper them um or or else they wouldn't have understood and they would have been very scared and worried for me and they would have they would have probably labeled me as one of those like not lost causes but just like one of those kids who are just going to be you know one of those kids who just is there and kind of tries weird stuff and kind of doesn't do anything and I and I didn't I guess I didn't want them to see me as that um yeah I guess that's why I don't know I was scared of how they'd see me uh, that's interesting and you know further Digging into that around the money topic, I feel like with a lot of creators, um, especially like, you know, artists like that are, you know, say actors or writers and things like that, where money isn't, it's not like when you worked your marketing job, you got a paycheck every two weeks. Here, it's like, you know, you do a couple of commercials, you might get a part in the film and, you know, you might make a chunk of money, but then you might not get something for a long period of time. So how do you think about money and how do you plan your finances so that, you know, um, you can kind of survive long term? you know, with your, you know, your life expenses, but still continue to do this. Cause I didn't notice on your site, you did, you know, I, I know like a lot of actors also, not a lot of, but like they also do writing, directing other kind of work, but I noticed a category called consulting and classes. So tell me about like how you go about making money and think about money. Yeah. I, I honestly like era, like, I don't know how, I don't know how actors who are just actors survive. I don't even, I can't even fathom if, if that was my career, if I was just like, I wake up, I, I work out, I do meditation, I do some Shakespeare, I do some whatever, I get, take a couple of classes and then all I do is audition whenever an audition comes and then just wait. I, I, I don't know how some of these, I mean, that's why a lot of them end up doing these Joe jobs, uh, working at bars and stuff, because it's, it, it's just not enough. Even at, even at, even if you're the most talented person and you're, freaking amazing that's not just reasonable because the industry is set up that way it's just unfortunate the industry is just set up that way there are not enough opportunities uh the theater industry um if you're doing theater uh, versus film like that's also very competitive limited work lower pay um and hours are ridiculous so then you have to like randomly quit your day joe job which has been sort of sustaining you to go take on this you know three-month contract in Sudbury for a theater company there so just being an actor is it it it's not viable, it's just not. Um, and and when I was slowly making that decision of like I'm gonna explore this thing, I did a lot of research. I again, it's the business background came in. I was like, hey, like 
I talked to a whole bunch of actors. How are you doing this? They all had Joe jobs. A lot of them worked on sets as PAs and um, first ADs and um, um, set decks and all these different positions. And I knew that I didn't want to do that because um, I just felt like those roles, which are great roles if you wanna be like a director filmmaker. But at that point when I started, I really just wanted to tell my stories in terms of like writing and exploring. So I knew that that wouldn't serve me. It does serve a lot of other actors, but wouldn't I knew it wouldn't serve my ultimate sort of super objective in life. Um, and so I needed to find another avenue. Um, and that's when I started employing the skills I learned in business school in conjunction with some of the needs of the art sector in Toronto. Um, so in the nonprofit art sector, there is a need for strong business skills in things like fundraising, strategic planning, um, board governance. These are skills that I had. So I said, why not merge the two and work in the art sector as that? And that's what I did. Um, so I worked for the York Region Arts Council full-time um, for three and a half years as their programming manager, running tons of community programs, running grants, mentorship program, residencies. And I leveraged those skill sets to then start my own practice of working with school boards and local arts councils and community groups on setting up their system. So that's what I do in between when I have acting, writing gigs, and it, it works for me. So I'm a, I'm a freelance creative business consultant. So that's yeah. interesting. So like you approach these different organizations and basically help them set up these programs that you previously were employed and you kind of learned that system through that, I guess, job. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I, got a, I got a lot of hands-on experience in my previous role, um, but even in that role, um, it was a wonderful organization, um, but a lot of arts organizations just they don't usually have the capacity um, to bring these necessary skill sets in because of the fact that most people who have these business skills that they learn through a degree or something don't work in nonprofit, right? They usually go the corporate route. And most of the people who work in admin um, or management roles in nonprofits are actually artists who, who you know, uh, they, they, they daylight as these roles while they moonlight in their artistic uh, practice of choice. So I was this anomaly, not a non anomaly, but I was this person who was kind of doing the backwards reverse where I came from business to the arts. So I had these really in demand skills that were transferable. Um, so it just worked out for me in that way. Um, and one of my coworkers that I met there is doing the reverse where she went to theater school and learned a ton of artistic skills that complemented my skills at, the, at that role. And then now she's doing her MBA. So um, it, it's really understanding that it's not a black and white industry of like acting that, and that there's more to it. And I was open to what that more is and sort of picked and choose, picked and chose which parts of it I wanted to give my time and energy to. That's fascinating. Um, what's been your, you know, what's been the impact of the Toronto Tamil community on you like on a personal and professional level? Like, do you feel like, are you fairly involved? Do you feel connected? I'm curious about that. Uh, like I said earlier about me not really seeing things as binary and looking at it in a spectrum. Um, all the things, like my Tamil identity and my relationship with my family as well, like it's been such a back and forth, up and down, zigzag across the, the stars type of thing. Um, Cause I, I was super happy with who I was when I was back home and uh, back home. And then when I came here over, from grade two, all the way up to grade, I slowly started hating who I was. Uh, like I said, in, when I watched these films on TV, I, I felt othered. My experience didn't matter. So I was trying to be like, what I basically was told by media was that what I am is wrong. So here's how to be right. And that's to see these other family structures and other types of relationships, other languages like English, uh, other ways of communication. So all these things in me changed. And I became very, um, for lack of a better word, like whitewashed. Um, and my brothers and siblings who were older than me who are uh, who had more time back home and had a stronger sense of their Tamil identity um, came here and were able to still stay strong to who they were, um, and so I kind of lost a lot of my um, Tamil identity and kind of internalized a lot of self judgment towards it. So that was all of elementary school and high school was also that, um, and university is where it sort of started to change because in university is when I started to have a larger discussion with myself about 
what are these things that affected me into becoming who I am? Because I started questioning my career. So that led to me questioning everything. And that's when I realized that um, I was inadvertently pushed away from my culture, whether I knew it or not. And, and I realized that at the end, at the end of the day, what, whatever I end up doing, wh whoever I end up becoming and whatever language I spoke, I'm still Tamil. Like that, that doesn't go away. And I needed to kind of explore that for myself and give it a full opportunity to be found before I make a decision about which parts of it I want to keep and which parts of it are me or not. And the, 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 the beginning step to that was me joining the TSA at my university, the Tamil Student Association. Um, and it was so funny because I was accepted to U Ottawa for uh, a program and I was accepted to Ryerson. And the only reason why I switched to Ryerson instead of U Ottawa is because I thought Ryerson just had a stronger Tamil community. And there were just a lot of like, and I heard lots of things about the TSA. Um, I mean, U Ottawa does too now, but yeah, back then. Uh, and I was so grateful. I did it. I was part of the TSA for one year. And that one year I learned so much from these, these other uh, students who were older, younger than me, who were born there, not born there, who all just had this one thing in common, which I never had with anybody in my life. Like it, at, at any point in my life, never did I have like one truly unifying thing um, that brought me together in a group, even in the acting world that never really happened. But with the TSA that happened, um, we listened to Tamil music. Uh, I was on the dance team. We'd do that and then we'd go out and eat and we'd have, we'd hang out and we'd, it was so cool. I've never had friends up till that point where you would talk shit in Tamil. Like I just never <laughs> did that. I never, I never used like Tamil bad words or like talk about my parents, uh, or say what I ate. Like it was, it's like stupid, normal things that I just never had the chance to do in my life. Um, my brothers did. They grew up in Scarborough and they had all their Tamil friends. I, I never did. Um, and so that was my journey, like away from my culture and then back to my culture. And then as I got older in my mid twenties, I started being like, how can I be Tamil and accept that identity while still being this guy who grew up in Canada? And, and that's kind of who you see now is this guy who, 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 who's unafraid to speak Tamil and have Tamil friends and do whatever he needs to do. Um, um, and I think I, I, I uh, but what's, I had a really cool way I put it because I've thought about this question before. What did I say? Um, uh... Money can be hard to come by, but here is a $100 opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win $100 when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? Uh, being, Tamil, being Tamil to me is like going downtown, eating like a $40 pasta and then coming home and still wanting to eat some rice and curry. Yeah. you know because you're unsatisfied that's 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 how I am right now and that's how this, this community has helped me um, and the last thing I'll quickly say on that is there is a wildly strong community in Toronto like Tamil community in Toronto that you know of um, and that was so inspiring because once I started accepting my identity I was like okay but like people like me aren't successful like I need to be white to be successful I need to act white or I need to whitewash myself to be successful and then I saw these people uh, like my two film mentors, uh, 90, VT90 and Maya Bastian, who were just wilding out and killing it, doing cool stuff and being so proud of their identity. And so that really inspired me to just be like, yeah, screw it. I I'm this version of Tamil and have it and take it or leave it. Love it. If you had a chance to go back in a time machine and visit 16 year old Ganesh, uh, what would you tell him? I would, I would tell him that I would tell him that being different is my superpower being different is my super, it's your superpower. Um, Cause it is, I spent so much of my life. Like it, it hurts me to think about how much of my life I spent trying to be something else, some version of me trying to learn music that I didn't care about. I don't care about indie rock. Like I don't, but I'm here like, oh yeah, let me learn about the Beatles or whoever the hell. But I want to like stay at home and listen to Bali Lanka and like dance to it. Like that's what I wanted to do, but I forced myself to be this other person. But now, my whole life exists on all these unique, unique things that make me who I am. My stories revolve around that. Um, my, the community I've built revolves around that. Um, any of my artistic choices and life choices revolve around those uniquenesses. I have gray hair. I, I dyed my hair gray because that's what I wanted to do. Um, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm so here for it. And I, and I really wish 16-year-old Ganesh like, was also there for that. Um, 
he would have had a great time being himself. And if you're looking forward in time, like in terms of your personal legacy, like how would you want to be remembered by your friends and family? Um, I don't, I don't really have any massive goal. Like I have like obvious career goals about, you know, what I do in terms of making films and like, I'm working on a TV series and writing a musical. Um, so like there's career goals. Um, but I don't think those are the things that leave. Um, I'm one of those people who believes on, um, like more than what you say or do people remember how you make them feel. And, and I, and I truly believe that. And anytime I interact with anyone, um, that's what I try to carry. It's like, what is the feeling I give them? Um, and, and the feeling I want people to remember me by, um, is two things. Like one, a sense of warmth. I think there's just so much darkness in the world that it's nice to just feel like, oh, when I'm with this person, I just feel a little, little bit of warmth, like a little fireplace in a cabin. Um, that's the feeling I want people to have when they're around me, just some warmth. Um, and that warmth can manifest to them however they want, uh, someone listening to them, someone loving them, someone um, making their voice uh, heard, whatever that may be. Uh, and then the other one is, um, uh, as someone who left no, lock, no rock unturned, uh, like I said, everything's a spectrum. I'll like different things at different points in my life. Um, so I just wish that whatever impulse I have at any moment in life, I, I, I follow that impulse. Um, it, it's a thing I learned in acting because in acting, a lot of people, when they start, they, they, they start to hold and, and enforce things, but your, your body is very into intellectual and it knows what it wants. And so when it's given prompts, it will have natural impulses. And when you let it release and be shown that is the most truthful thing you can show an audience um and so in my life i like to just i want to pick up this rock right now i'm going to pick it up if i want to go fly to japan for two months i'm going to fly to japan for two months um, and i know privilege is a part of it um and i don't make a crazy amount of money or anything and those are all things i consider but at the core of it it's about hey he's a guy who followed his impulses okay well that's a good way to segue into the final segment of the podcast it's a uh... Fun game I like to call Creator Confessions. I'm going to say a bunch of statements and you're going to say uh, your first quick kind of, you know, answer to them. You ready? Oh, God. Okay. Favorite Tamil food? Uh, chini jambal. Oh, my God. Anything with chini jambal. Uh, something that scares you? Um, um, uh, ooh, ran random bugs I don't know. <laughs> Insecurity you have? Body image is something I deal with all the time. Favorite show you're watching? I've watched The Office way too many times. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. It's every night I fall asleep to The Office. <laughs> Place you're itching to travel to after the pandemic is over. I'd love to, I'd love to go back to Colombia. I was in Cartagena a couple of years ago and I'd love to go back there. They, they have a wonderful familial feeling. A fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? Oh, I mean, I already, I already talked about two of my favorite filmmakers, uh, VT90, killing it. Um, she has a new feature film coming out. Um, and Maya Bastian, um, who's also killing it um, and working on a TV show. And yeah, really wonderful people. Favorite childhood memory? Climbing uh, a jackfruit tree. Something you like to do for fun outside of work? Uh, as you read in my bio, I love gardening. I spend an inexorably stupid amount of money on making my garden grow. Favorite film of all time? Favorite film of all time. Okay, well, like, um, like a Tamil film, like Pariyapa, I love it. It's just so wonderful. Um, and, and it's just so the essence of Tamil cinema and stylistically just all of how Tamil comedy, Tamil romance, how Tamil, Tamil heroes, like all work. I, I just love it. Um, and then as a, in terms of English film, um, I really, really just love the whimsical story of Narnia. Yeah. Good movie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a purchase you've made in the last couple of years that you've splurged on, but you have zero regret about. Splurged on a purchase. A hand vacuum. Um, hand vacuum. A hand is that's I don't know if that's the right answer, but um it it's as a as an adult now, uh, who has to like take care of stuff and clean a house and clean a kitchen and all that stuff. A hand vacuum is very handy because you don't need to take a, you don't need to sweep, you don't need to pull the full vacuum out. You just go in and grab the thing. There's a cobweb, you grab it. It sounds so boring, but this is what I do. Like you do the laundry, there's like dust, you hand vacuum it. I don't know why this is the item I chose, but yeah, hand vacuum. Pet peeve. 
Okay. It, mm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a modified answer. It's not a. It, it's it, I don't want to. It's not really a pet peeve. Um, more so than it just disheartens me is I I, I struggle. I, I empathize with and feel really disheartened when I when I when I see someone who has lost their sense of identity or have not found it. That's just so. Um, identity is such an important part of us and a lot of people these days because of social media and all these things lose it um, or can't find it or misplace it and it's just so disheartening to watch someone go through that part of their life yeah if you knew that you were going to die tomorrow a regret that you would have i didn't call my mama back um I would, yeah. a celebrity or person whose life you'd want to experience for one day hmm that's a great question there's so many celebrities uh Hmm. I would say, you know what? No, I would have liked, okay. Uh, I'll like modify the question again. Cause why not? Um, I would have loved to experience Russell Peter's life, like during his peak, like when he was just like killing it in the early 2000s. I just wanted like, he was the first guy on the scene, just like killing it. I mean, obviously racy jokes, uh, but he got, and he got away with them, but like, just like, like it was amazing. He's a guy from like the GTA, just like blew up that's wild before social media like he blew up on his own without like internet and blah 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 um and i wanted i would have loved to just like see that all happen and, and the proudness that he and his family probably felt a book you've read or a podcast you've listened to that's had an impact on you um the uh 100 the four agreements by don Luis. i'm forgetting the um, no miguel don miguel ruiz um it's, it's a wonderful book uh, that was recommended to me by an acting coach, but it really applies to anybody in real life. It basically talks about how there are these four agreements that we should all make with ourselves about how we go about in the world. Um, and it has to do with um, how we uh, are impeccable with our words. I can't remember all four, but impeccable, be impeccable with your words um, is one of them where you, you really understand the power of your words. So when you say something negative, you actually put and perpetuate negativity in the world. So you're actually causing, th causing the negativity and then it'll go around and come back to you. So it's like just being cognizant about the energy and the way we see the world and how that can then reflect the world we actually see. Um, game changer. What's a new belief, behavior, habit that's improved your life? Oh, um, take, it, take everything one step at a time, one goal at a time, one new skill at a time, one step at a time. You, no, no, no point in overwhelming yourself. Your brain doesn't work that way. And finally, a piece of advice that you would give to your fellow aspiring Tamil creators out there. There are so many reasons not to do something, but I think your intrinsic desire to do it is stronger than all of them. So do it. Great way to end off. So Ganesh, that was, a, that was a great episode. I think people are going to enjoy it. Now, someone listen to this, maybe a, you know, a future, you know, big actor, or just, you know, someone that uh, is going to be an amazing creator out there. They listen to your story. They're inspired. They want to reach out to you. What's the best way for them to do that? Um, I guess Instagram. Instagram is where I'm um, most reachable, I guess. Uh, my Instagram handle is at Ganesh Tava. So um, you can hit me up there and i um, happy to chat with anyone trying to figure this out. Uh, I talk with a whole bunch of emerging people all the time. Um, and I have a whole bunch of sort of people who are five years ahead of me who mentor me. So it's, we just got to pay it forward. So I'm here for anyone who needs it on any level. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Ganesh, for jumping on, sharing your story. Um, lots of good nuggets in there. And um, to the audience, as always, appreciate you guys listening. So on to the next one. <laughs> Thanks.